Community interactions. Community interactions are all of the populations of organisms inhabiting a common environment and interacting with one another. So these are the types of interactions. There's competition, predation, and symbiosis. So we're going to look at each one at a time now. So this one's competition. Two species use the same limiting resource. So they are both competing. Um, the hyenas and the lion are both competing to eat whatever it is that the lion just killed. Here's another example, maybe a little bit less exciting though. So here's an organism grown all by itself, P. ariella, and um, here's P. caudatum grown all by itself. And when you put both species together, um, this one, the ariella, outcompetes the caudatum. The next one is predation, eating of live organisms. So here's um, a ladybug eating maybe an aphid. And predation can c control the abundance of prey. So for example, um, this is a mussel, I guess, and a starfish is eating it up. So this is one thing um, that's kind of important in a community. So if there were no predators around, then perhaps all the mussels would um, take over and there would just be tons and tons of mussels. But since there is a predator that feeds um, more on mussels than on other um, shellfish, there might be more species diversity, meaning more different types of shellfish in the area. So predation involves the evolution of the predator and the prey species. So the predator um, over many generations might get better at getting the prey, and the prey over many generations might get better at eluding the predator. So these, um, over time, over many, many generations, can affect the speed and the strength, um, maybe the teeth, the intelligence. These are just some examples of um, some things, some characteristics that can change in a population over time. Defensive adaptations in plants also occur. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. There can be structures like thorns um, or spines. And then there can be chemicals, so things like nicotine or cinnamon, um, chemicals that the plants made in order to deter something that eats it. Here's one defensive adaptation in anima animals um, called concealment or camouflage. So this looks a whole lot like a turd, and it is, in fact, a caterpillar. And this looks a whole lot like a stick, and it's actually um, <laughs> some type of you know caterpillar. How cool is that? And then... There's a disagreeable taste that you could have. So, for example, the monarch butterfly tastes bad. Um, you can have a stink bug or a bombardier beetle, and they all do something kind of unpleasant for the one who's eating it. This part's not in your notes, but um, this is a bombardier beetle. It injects an explosive mixture of chemicals and enzymes into a reaction chamber in its abdomen. The, re the mixture of chemicals and enzymes vi uh, volatilizes instantly upon contact with the air, generating a puff of smoke and an audible popping sound, hopefully to scare off its predator so it runs away. So it's a pretty cool adaptation. Here are some more anti-predator defenses. So warning coloration. It teaches predators to avoid a species that could harm them. So you could be a poisonous um, frog and tell the whole world about it by being bright blue. Or you could be a wasp and be black and yellow, which um, will warn predators that you sting. All of these butterflies taste bad, and um, one thing that's interesting is they all kind of look alike, and so it helps predators to know, hey, this black and orange one is, is bad, and um, so this one might live longer if not only it makes the bad stuff, but it also looks like others that make the bad stuff. And that leads us to the next part called mimicry. This is when harmless species mimic something that's dangerous or unpalatable. So, for example, this little um, larvae looks a whole lot like a snake. Or these two snakes. So here's the model. This this um, snake is poisonous, and this snake looks a whole lot like it, but there's nothing poisonous about it. It's just that um, that if it has this coloration, organisms are more likely to leave it alone. So this one is um, the mimic. Oops. Here's another example. Um, let's see. Here's the model, the black and yellow, um, and this one stings. And these just kind of look like it, but they're mimics. So. They look like the bad guy and um, get eaten less often because of that. The next one is symbiosis. So this is another community interaction. This is a close and long-term association between two species. So for example, these are lichen, um, which are fungi and, um, and algae. So it's, um, you'll see them whenever you go hiking, and you'll see um, stuff growing on rocks, occasionally on trees, but don't confuse it with moss. It's not the kind of soft, fuzzy stuff. It's the leafy kind of stuff. 
So this can be, um, a symbiosis can be good or bad or neutral. This one happens to be a good one. So here's a bad uh, symbiosis, this, at least for one organism. Um, parasitism has one organism that benefits and one that harms. So for example, these are red blood cells and these are the parasite that causes malaria in the red blood cell. So the parasite's doing great and the organism that it's in, the host, is doing badly. So that's a um, plus, minus. And then the next one is mutualism. This is something that's beneficial to both. So these are the roots of maybe a clover plant, and these little nodules are nodules that the root um, of the plant will actually grow, and inside that are bacteria, and these bacteria will fix nitrogen. And so the plant benefits by getting nitrogen from the bacteria, and the bacteria benefits because it gets sugar and a moist place to live from the plant. Oops. And so that's what it says here, nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the root nodules of clover or other legumes. Here's another example. This one's not in your notes, but it's just another, I think, totally cool example. Ants defend the Acadia tree from harmful insects or animals. In return, the tree supplies the ants with protein lipid nodules called Belshian uh, bodies from its le le leaflet tips and carbohydrate-rich nectar from glands on its leaf stalk. So this plant actually makes food <laughs> for the bugs that protect it, which is kind of amazing. Okay, so let's look at some more examples of uh, mutualism. So here's um, Nemo, or some clownfish, with the sea anemone. And so Nemo um, gets a good place to live that's safe because any organism that comes by to try to eat it will probably get eaten by this instead. And the benefit to this sea anemone is that um, Nemo's really bright, and so he, um, he attracts other fish to come by to get eaten. This is lichen that I was talking about a little bit ago. It's a symbiosis between fungi and algae. And so the fungi get a nice moist, oh, sorry, backwards, um, the algae get a nice moist place to live. Um, and the fungi get the photosynthetic products of the algae. And here's, um, I don't know, some type of, I don't know, antelope or whatever, some gra grass grazing organism. And it's getting the bugs um, taken off of it by these really cool birds. And then here's a pollinator. So the plant is getting pollinated and the bee is getting nectar or whatever it is. And then finally, commensalism. This is when one benefits, and it seems like there's no effect on the other. So, I don't know. This one is a little... Well, let's explain it first. So here's the whale, and so it has barnacles on it. And so the whale seems to not be affected by these barnacles. The barnacles have, um, have a good because they get a ride all over the ocean, so they can take their... Um, themselves kind of anywhere so their offspring can be transported to a totally different area and that's a benefit for us for it I would think it wouldn't be too wonderful to have barnacles on me if I were a whale but it doesn't seem to harm the whale so the barnacles attached to the whales the barnacle benefits by being transported to new sources of food and by getting its babies dispersed and the whale doesn't seem to be hurt or helped and I'm gonna stop there for right now